Welcome to Elixir Wizards, a podcast where we talk about software development with software developers from around the world. We're especially interested in our favorite language, the Elixir language. And my name is Justice Epen. I will be your host today. I'm a developer here at SmartLogic, a Baltimore-based consulting company that has been building custom web and mobile software applications since 2005. From the SmartLogic team today, we have myself, Justice, and my brilliant magical co-host eric ostrich say hi eric hello eric do wizards have like titles like are you like mage eric or like grand master eric or something like that i think we just call ourselves wizards wizards warlocks sorcerers magical beings our theme this season is working with elixir this is season three we're very excited to be talking with guests on various themes and sort of topics about working with elixir performance functional programming hiring and training which is what we're talking about today. Actually, we're talking about hiring and training. We are joined by a very special guest from Podium, Mr. Brad Trailer. Say hi, Brad. Hey, thanks for having me on, fellas. We're super glad to have you, Brad. Podium was at Elixir this year, 2019, and gave a super duper awesome video demo. And I think everybody now in the community knows who you are because of that. So Brad, could you maybe Tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your background, about Podium, and how you all got started with Elixir. Absolutely. So again, thanks a lot for having me on. It's an absolute pleasure to talk with you guys. I'm Brad Trailer, originally from Utah. I started in engineering about eight-ish years ago. Primarily, my background is in the .NET realm. My first exposure to Elixir came at Podium. Kind of a weird story around that is when I was interviewing here a little over a year ago, speaking with our head architects, I asked what tech stack we're in. And... They mentioned, you know, kind of the front end with React and then they dove in. Yeah, and primarily our back end is Elixir where we've got a couple services left in Rails, but moving over to Elixir. And I paused for what felt like <laughs> hours, not knowing what in the hell Elixir was. And honestly, I thought I was being punked by them. And uh, you know, they, they kind of shared a laugh around it. But that was my first exposure to Elixir. And then getting to dive in with the amazing devs here we have at Podium and then the community we have around Elixir has been, I wouldn't lie and tell you it's been easy. It's been, it's been a challenge to pick up, but uh, it's been super rewarding and now there's no going back. So how did you become the, I guess we'll, we'll kind of transition into recruiting and, and hiring and, and all that. So how did you become the engineering manager at such a cool up and coming startup that pulls in all these Elixir developers? Oh man, I'd like to say a little bit of luck. So I actually knew the CTO that is down here at Podium. I had worked with him at a previous company, but hearing, you know, Podium, it's only a five-year-old company. We just hit our five-year anniversary, but the hype and the boom around Podium, uh, especially in the area uh, in which we live, has been, uh, you know, it's not just within the tech community. Podium is very involved within the community as a whole. So coming here, the way that I got here was really by digging in and getting, finding where I wanted to go with my career and finding the best places that would be the next stepping stone for my career. And really, I had my expectations high from previous companies and I was looking for a rocket ship and Podium was top of that list. And so, yeah, that's really how I ended up here. Could you maybe go into that search just a little bit more? Like, I'm curious, like when you were looking at rocket ship startups, like to potentially join, how did you vet them and make that judgment? I mean, obviously there's people who make a lot of money deciding if it's a rocket ship startup or not. So I'm curious, like how you made that sort of judgment. Yeah, thanks for calling me out and then uh, asking to provide more context. That was a pretty vague answer I gave. So really, that is what was stand out to me is what I was looking for is I always wanted to be in in leadership. So since I got into engineering, I knew I wanted to be in leadership. And really, the basis behind this, I have a passion for working with people. But tying into the tech stack, I worked my butt off to learn how to code. Going into college, I had never touched code before. And so, you know, for X amount of years, I busted my butt learning how to code. And so if I was going to go into, you know, quote unquote, people management side of things, I didn't want to lose the tech side of things. At previous companies, I was never able to really find that balance of being able to take the skills, the hard skills, the tech skills that I worked so hard for and apply those with my passion in working with people. It was usually one or the other. I'd been at companies where by title, I was director and I was still coding 80, 90% of the time. I'd been at a company where, again, being a leader, you know, having a leadership title and not being allowed to get access and not being allowed to sort any code on my computer or anything like that. And so I was really looking for a way to have a balance in that to where I could do the people side of things and the tech side of things. 
that is outside of the people here at Podium. That was the biggest thing that stood out to me is that when I got here, there were I had two other peers in engineering managers, and they were just fresh new into the job. They were experienced developers here at Podium, but just moving into management. And so they were there was no definition for what an engineering manager was. It was super exciting to me to come in to help make that, to take a vision and help apply that and being able to grow into career and take, yeah, I don't get a code as much as I used to. I realized that kind of going into this career field, but if I need to get in the code, I'm allowed and I'm actually welcome to get in the code. I can hop in with these devs, you know, anytime they'll, they'll have me and it's not shamed on, it's not shied away and it's really welcomed. And so that was the biggest deciding factor in really me coming to Podium. You've been there for a, a little while now. Can you talk about this sort of growth trajectory before we got on the call you mentioned that you've got 150 engineers working over there now when did you get started like where along that timeline were you and what has that growth curve looked like from a management developer perspective oh to sum it up it's a challenge the growth here at podium has been almost indescribable it really so to throw out some numbers some hard numbers there when i got here overall in the company i believe i was oh, i could double check this i'm a low 300s employee high twos, low threes. As of today, by the end of the year, we'll be over 800 employees. And that's primarily based here in Lehigh. We also have sales office in in Melbourne. And then we just opened up an engineering office in Brazil. So it's becoming a worldwide thing, but primarily we're all here in Lehigh, Utah. So more than double the growth in a year. I officially started at Podium almost exactly a year now. Engineering when I got here was right around, including software engineers, our small QA team, and then our DevOps team were right in between 55 and 60. Now we're sitting, like you said, right around 150 in a year's time. And uh, we show no signs of slowing down. We're still growing like crazy. We have the need for 150 more devs uh, in the next year. So when you go to start recruiting those next 150 devs, what's that process look like? There's a couple different ways we go about it. One thing here at Podium that's really unique with how we recruit is that we don't do it very much. And I'll kind of provide some more contacts in there. A majority of our hires are referrals. And when I say majority, uh, I don't have the numbers right in front of me. It was right around 80% of applicants that even apply to Podium. They come from someone who's already working here, usually another engineer. Out of those you know, 80-ish percent that get in with our process, only 25% of them are hired. So I want to throw those out there with kind of caveat that, hey, yeah, we're growing like crazy, but we still have a very, very high standard for our engineers. So as far as recruiting... We're doing more of it, especially as we grow out of our area here. So we're starting to do more campus recruiting. Uh, We just finished up a recruiting trip at University of Michigan. Expanding into Brazil, we're doing more recruiting around there. We'd love to be involved in the community, especially with the tech community. So sponsoring, you know, Elixir conferences down in Brazil also as well. And then we're looking into starting more local conferences here in the next year. But really, that's kind of been our secret sauce is referrals. And then another really unique thing, at least in my experience to Podium, is we come off as somewhat of a young engineering org. And that's not to say young by age, but we don't have, you go to a lot of companies, especially successful companies, you think, okay, they've got devs who are extremely experienced, been in the industry multiple, multiple years. Here at Podium, we have a lot of devs who come from boot camps. We have a lot of success with the boot camps around us, whether it be uh, Lambda, Dev Mountain, Dev Point Labs, just to name a few. There's a bunch of others, but we've seen a ton and ton of talent come out of those. So in partnership with them, where we can do to help them out and to kind of <laughs> just grow them into podium engineers. We have a new building coming up here in Lehigh, and we're looking to uh, share that building with a boot camp or two. And so that they can just go get their training and then come up a couple floors and start writing code for us. I want to dive into this a little bit because I'm sure we have lots of business owners, business leaders listening to the show. What what do you find is the biggest challenge when recruiting Elixir developers specifically? Elixir devs are few and far between, especially good ones. It's a newer technology, right? It hasn't been around like Java and .NET and, you know, other ones. And so Fewer people know about it. I mean, maybe I'm, I told you my kind of embarrassing story, maybe, you know, about being ignorant, not even knowing what Elixir was. Another challenge that we found, and I'm, I'm sure we'll dive into this later in the podcast, but I don't know that this is exclusive to Elixir devs, but I've found it in a lot of Elixir devs is the opportunity to work 100% remote. And that's something that we at Podium here haven't found a good solution for yet. So with that, we are actively working on it. You got my word that we're going to have something and, and have it within the next year or so. But that's been a challenge because Elixir devs, you mentioned, you know, we, we're in a partnership with Platformatech and Jose Valem, and 
you know, they work remote primarily. They don't want to pack up their life and move to Lehigh, Utah right off the bat, just, you know, never being here, never living here. And so that has been a, a struggle that we are actively trying to solve. Well, when you are ready to make that transition to partial remote, full remote, you can talk to us because Eric and I are both full remote. I'm actually in the office today, but normally I am not. And yeah, it's sort of a new experience for us at SmartLogic as well. Hey, awesome, man. I'll, I'll put your guys' names down. We'll reach out. All right. So we already heard that you don't exclusively hire people that know Elixir. Obviously, the boot camps probably aren't quite there yet. So what do you look for when you're hiring someone who doesn't know Elixir, but will primarily be writing Elixir? So from my perspective, from a hiring manager perspective, I look for two things in any engineer, almost in any position that I'd hire for, but specifically with engineers. I look for if you're a learner and with a learner, you need to be, have the, the want, the need, the ability to learn in a group environment and, and more importantly, learn by yourself. You got to have that drive to learn, especially in this industry and with something as new and in my perspective, as challenging as Elixir was to learn coming from an object oriented background. It's not just something where I can come into the office for an hour and read a book and say, oh, cool, I know Elixir now. So you have to have that one, that drive to push yourself and to learn. On top of it, technology, not just Elixir, but technology in general is changing out from under our feet by the second. And if you're not constantly learning, it's going to go away from you real quick. The other main point that I always look for in hiring is I look for a, not just a culture fit, but really a culture add. What can this person add to our culture? And really the scenario I always paint in my head is justice. If you were here interviewing a podium, I'd look at it to say, okay, if justice and I got assigned a project, it was just us two. We had you know a week to work on it. So for eight to 10 hours for five days, me and Justice are working on this project. Can I work with this person? Can this person work with me? So that goes into a couple of things. One, is Justice able to provide me feedback, whether it be you know candid feedback or you know passive feedback? On the flip side, are you able to take that feedback? Is it something where you always have to be down in the weeds? Are you able to get back from a you know in a pairing scenario? Are you able to be both the driver and the brain? So those are the two main things I look for. Let's see what else. We also, so I mentioned us being a younger engineering org and the benefit that we get from that in skilling engineers into to learning Elixir is that they don't come with a lot of bad habits that, that may come from different tech stacks or from, and I say bad habits with quotes there, right? Maybe bad habits in Elixir and they work great in other languages, but primarily with us being a younger-ish org and having the success with boot camps is they come in fresh and raw and green and we get to upskill them into writing Elixir the best way we know how and we'd like to think we do it pretty damn well. Which leads us into a question that I am definitely interested in. How do you guys think about like cross-training in different languages? Lately on our team, we've been working on projects and I mean, like I'm a Ruby developer initially, have learned Elixir over the last three years here at SmartLogic. And now today I'm working on projects that are like Elixir, Python, Rust, and a bunch of shell scripting, that kind of thing. So I'm curious, like, how do you guys think about cross-training different languages? Is that a priority for you at all? Do you have enough diversity in your language stack to justify it? Great question. So we are an Elixir shop. So we're not in a, I've been in companies in the past where it was kind of a polyglot, like, hey, the teams are autonomous enough. You choose what stack tech stack you're working there. We're not there here at Podium. I don't know that we'll ever get there. And really, it just comes down to how well Elixir has treated us. The other thing is that we oh, really- script on the front end, yeah. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. So yeah, Elixir is our server side, our back end code. We're a React on the front end. GraphQL, Postgres, you know, kind of the works there. So yeah, thank you for calling me out. Yeah, there we go. (laughs) But so at this time, we're not looking to add any new languages to that stack. Now we're not opposed to it. We very much so encourage our teams to experiment. So for example, just a little while ago, we had a couple engineers who are very passionate about TypeScript. They found an opportunity in a product to implement TypeScript and kind of the requirements we have around implementing something new or or with these experiments is what are the metrics for success? So if we're going to make a change like that, how do we determine that it was successful, that it worked out and that it's worth our time going in there? And so moving forward, we're not opposed to anything. I know that as Podium grows, we'll continue to evolve. But right now, looking at the landscape, we don't see any plans to move off of our current tech stack, especially on our back end with Elixir. It, It has treated us well and done wonders for us. Out of curiosity, I'm familiar with your product. It's I'm not at all familiar with your architecture. It sounds, I mean, I'm just making this up. Like, is this like a microservice architecture with multiple Elixir services that are interacting or do you sort of have one main application? These questions you're allowed to answer on a podcast. Absolutely. Yeah. So currently we're a microservice architecture. We've got 
Oh goodness, over a hundred micro, or excuse me, hundred apps running. Yeah, I don't know the exact numbers. So I'll ballpark and give you a hundred plus. A couple of years ago, we originally started. We were a monolith Rails app, and now with our transition into Elixir, we've evolved into a yeah microservice architecture. All Elixir apps running all over the place, and yeah, it's treated us well. Which leads me to my next question, because with a hundred microservices or more in production. Onboarding developers must be, I mean, maybe a nightmare is the right word. Can you talk a little bit about that process? Absolutely. So I would take, you would think, especially the way the picture I painted and the way I've described it, that it would be an absolute nightmare. It's really one of my favorite parts of the job and one of my favorite parts of Podium because I feel we do this extremely well. So I'll walk you through kind of a typical onboarding for a new engineer. Your first day, you have a one-on-one -on -one with your engineering manager, most likely your tech lead on your team. With that, you'll have at least one mentor, possibly more. They could be on the team you're working on, the product you're working on. They could be somewhere else within the org. So you'll have them to kind of help and guide you. And with those one-on-ones and the mentors, it's just really to help set expectations, get you um, into the culture and get you to start writing code. We don't the one thing we don't go about in our onboarding process is it's not a, hey, Justice, your first three months, you're actually not going to write code for us. You're just going to do A, B, and C and, you know, really get ingrained more in the culture and learn our stack, that kind of stuff. We go the exact opposite logic. So your first one to two days, our goal is your first day, but at least within your first two days, you're cutting a PR to prod. So you're getting code you're writing code, you're seeing the process of, you know, getting it reviewed, getting the process. And then with our full CICD pipeline, it's going up. So you can see that immediate value and kind of see that route that you're taking. We've seen that work wonders just more for, I mean, you think about just from a confidence perspective, any dev coming in, I don't care what company you came from. If you're God's gift to coding, you have to be onboarded and onboarding, you know, depending on the company and, and the, the problems you're trying to solve, it's a timely matter. It's not something you can just snap your fingers. And so setting that confidence, you're coming in somewhat, you know, you should be nervous. I would expect you to be nervous and, and almost weary. We want to get rid of that real quick. We want to instill that confidence in you, get that code up, show you, hey, you can do this and then set you free to go. And so then how do you think about, like, talk a little bit about the DevOps challenge of getting like a totally, let's say like a bootcamp dev, like when they show up on day one, like they're not spinning up all 100 microservices locally. Like, what are you using to orchestrate all that? That's a great question. One that I probably wouldn't be the best person to answer for it, but to kind of tie into some of your question there is they definitely don't spend up all 100 services. They spin up what's necessary for the product in which they're working on. Now, that's not to say some of our devs, it might require... I wouldn't say all of services, but a very good majority chunk of them. And so from a DevOps perspective, yeah, I've got to assume, you know, with a peer that I work with, that's their responsibility is it's challenging, but it's something that we feel gives us a, an advantage, especially from a recruiting perspective. And then also, like I said, the training and onboarding, when you get to come to a company, you know, with a, a reputation like Podium and you get to contribute right away, it's something that we put a high priority on and that it's something that we want to make sure happens. So once we're past day one and it's uh, day two, week two, week three, et cetera, like how do you keep training the developers who are already there and keeping them like sharp? Great question. So a couple of things. Our org is very collaborative. So we have, as of today, 23 product teams. All 23 of those product teams are fully autonomous, meaning they're not dependent on each other, but they still collaborate and work very much so together on a daily basis. And so some things we do to help curve that learning, a lot of our teams, pair program and mob program, it's not a requirement. It's not something that we make our teams do, but a lot of them do that. Some other things that we use that are, I had never had experience to these until I got to Podium. We run nerd lunches every week. The basis behind a nerd lunch is, hey, for one, you get free lunch. The next part of it is that uh, we get one or multiple of our devs, they get a hop up on our stage area and they get to teach our organization something new. And so when I say something new, it could be one of those experiments that I referred back to, kind of the learnings that come from that. It could be, hey, we just attended a conference. We like to send our devs to conference and represent in conferences as much as possible. It could be something new they learn there and they want to bring back with us. And it's not just specific to technology. It's more specific to just the software uh, lifecycle in general. But with that, you know, we like to keep it, it, for the most part, it goes in pretty technical. So whether it be, you know, this new design pattern in Elixir, we did a Kafka deep dive a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. So that's one big thing we do. We also do tying into your question uh, previously around 
do we hire only Elixir dev? My answer was no. So how do we teach people Elixir? We run a weekly, we call it Elixir 101. It's kind of a classroom setting to where we provide all of our engineers, they have access to multitude of books, primarily Elixir books uh, are the popular ones there, but we'll work through. So we have a, we're big on mentoring here. And so we'll have our devs have a, they'll run a course. Now, whether that be them go through a video course with you or chapters in the book or building something on the fly, going through a Kokata and teaching you something new about Elixir. And really that, the Elixir 101 is to form your fundamental basics. So you have a foundation moving forward to being Elixir dev. So I would say my favorite part of how we learn here at Podium and grow, we have what's called Friday Fury. So every other Friday, so twice a month, our teams step away from their basic roles and responsibilities within their product, so within their team. And as what they get to do is they get to somewhat pick and choose something that they're passionate to work on that can contribute to our product. It started as kind of like a paper cut UI Friday Fury, and it's just evolved into so much more. But the, the purpose behind it is our devs get a, a chance to step away from their day-to-day role. They get to choose something that they want to fix and that they see can add value. And the kind of requirement, albeit a somewhat loose requirement around Friday Fury, is it's something that you start that day, you work on that day, you finish that day, you push to production. The whole point behind it is being adding immediate customer value. And it's crazy to see the amount of innovation that comes out of something like that when when you, the dev, get to choose what's important to you and push your boundaries to add that immediate value and kind of see the full picture. So it's not just, hey, I'm really passionate about writing this code, but it's, hey, me learning to do this and add this code in this way is going to benefit the end user down the line in this way. And I get to do it in this amount of time. So... We want to move into some maybe lighter questions here. I'm curious, is there anything that you've recently read or an event that you attended or maybe a podcast that you listened to that was like a great experience for you as far as you know consuming Elixir resources is concerned? One of the reasons why I'm speaking with you guys is that you guys recently had one of our architects, Travis Elnicki, on. So uh, this podcast is the most recent technology-specific podcast that I've listened to. And um, now I'm a full-time subscriber. So uh, awesome work there. The audience can't see my happy face. Oh, okay. Doing it right. <laughs> that would be the latest technology-specific or Elixir-specific resource that I've learned, I guess, outside of going through... Um, exorcism.io type stuff or anything I can do on my own. But with you guys is uh, where I'll start my podcast experience Elixir wise. So exorcism is a great plug. I'm curious, is there a resource that you wish existed? (sighs) Great question. Right now, I don't think, I I mean, I feel like we have everything we need. Now that's going to, yeah, you ask me tomorrow, I'll probably have, oh no, no. Yeah. Now we need this. Right now we're in a really comfy place where I feel like we've got the proper tool set to continue to learn and grow, uh, especially within our engineering org. But just like technology, that's going to change real quick. When you're onboarding these, uh, these like bootcamp developers, is there a resource that you point them to, you know, as like a default, like go check this one out to get started? Yeah. So we give pragmatic courses, pragmatic software. They have a couple good courses that tie right into our stack. So we give a majority of our new devs, unless they come in super experienced and don't need it. But we give them them two courses in there, Elixir Basics and then their Phoenix course, just to kind of, hey, get your, you know, dabble in this, get your hands wet. And and that way, you you know, you're not going in blind. So we like to give that to devs either before they start here at Podium, after they've accepted an offer or within their first week. And then, you know, other than that, like I said, we're very collaborative. We do the old fashioned person to person mentoring a lot. So we rely on, we have a group of senior engineers that we hold to a really high standard and really even just, even just, that's kind of throwing shade at them there. So I didn't mean to do that, but all engineers here at Podium, we have a very, very high standard. And one of those standards is a requirement of this job is to mentor, to bring on that next generation. We don't silo here at Podium. We don't silo teams. We don't silo products. We don't silo knowledge and we don't silo individuals. And so in that collaboration, that's really been our biggest tool that we go to. Justice, you asked if there's any other books or anything I've been reading recently. One that doesn't tie into Elixir directly, but one that I would highly recommend for anybody in this industry, anybody in this field is The Manager's Path by Camille Fournier. So it's been something as Podium, as we've grown like crazy, you know, coming up with a career structure and a career path for our devs. This book has been a godsend for us. 
and how Camille explains her experiences going from growth of getting a college degree, moving into being a software engineer, and then all the way up the ladder into a CTO. And she kind of dives into the technical manager aspect, also into the people management. And so it's been eye-opening. And like I said, I, I couldn't recommend it highly enough. That is awesome. I personally am really into, I guess you would call this like professional development, especially like leadership books. So I'll check that out. Yeah, I don't have any further questions. What about you, Eric? Yeah, I think we just have one more outside of our final plug anything. So how do you challenge yourself to continue to learn and grow and then continue that to make all of your other developers? Is there anything specific that you, I guess, outside of what we've already talked on? I wouldn't say anything outside of what we already talked on. I just want to continue to, to hit on. We uh, here at Podium, we have the smartest people that I've ever worked with in my career. I lean on them a lot. And when I say them, I mean, it's, it's everybody from you know, the engineer that just started yesterday that just graduated a boot camp, all the way to our most senior engineers. It doesn't matter whether they're on my team or not. I come in with a open mindset to learn from everybody. And so I lean on them a whole lot. Whenever I get a chance to pair and dive in, you know, kind of get into the weeds with my team, I'll admit right up front, it's not as much as some days that I want, but the team welcomes me and even, you know, I guess kind of taking a handicap for it saying, all right, yeah, I guess we'll have to take this step back to let Brad come pair with us here. Because like I said, I work with the smartest devs that I've ever been around. And so I lean on them a lot to, to continue to challenge me and push me forward in my career. That's hilarious because I find myself asking Eric and <laughs> to give up his valuable time to pair with me. Yeah. Yeah, I know exactly how you feel. I want to give you a chance for any final plugs, any asks for the audience and where people can find you, how to get involved with Podium. Shameless self-promotion now is your shot. First of all, if I could just thank you guys again for having me on. This, Like I said, this is the first Elixir specific or you know, real, I guess, technical podcast I've listened to. I'm a subscriber now. And so tying in, if, if you have any interest in Podium, please reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn, Brad Trailer. That's Taylor with an R. <laughs> you can find us, obviously, podium.com, uh, the careers section in there. We are hiring any and all positions for the most part. Yeah, I guess I guess that's my plug. I thought, thought I could do a little bit better than that, but I guess that's the best I got for you. I think that was an excellent, <laughs> excellent plug. Brad Trailer from Podium, thank you so much for joining us today. Once again, this has been Elixir Wizards with Smart Logic. I am Justice Epen. My co-host is Eric Ostrich, and we will catch you next time, Wizards. Wizards.